What's up, everybody? Uh, this is Joe Cronin from Corrupted, and I'm here with Old Man Davey, and we are going to talk about Star Trek Discovery, uh, the new series that you have to pay for if you want to watch it, unless you're outside the U.S., and then you get it on Netflix. Let's. Um, I've co- I've talked a little bit about a couple episodes of Star Trek on here on Corrupted, a little bit on my Patreon, and then a little bit on Final Frontier News. And so, just to tie it all in, let's start from the beginning. Um, what What are your thoughts on this this being a paid for uh, thing on the CBS app? Are you upset about that? Were you ha- didn't care? What, what did you feel about that? Uh, I'm really not too concerned about paying for it uh i mean it 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 does suck and there's no real other way to watch it i think it's a cheap gimmick overall you know to have to pay to watch a television show that's you know basically the adventures of specialist transsexual and her friends lieutenant homo and cadet autism you want me to pay for that (laughs) i never thought about it like that but that's pretty goddamn funny uh they uh no they um yeah they derive from everything that was Star Trek because Star Trek was so free before, you know, and it was, um, like TNG was shown everywhere and it was free. It was, uh, syndicated. So it's like, that wasn't even on cable that you had to pay for. That was just on regular television. I was still in, for most of TNG, I was in New Hampshire and we had like the rabbit ears on the TV. Like we didn't get cable out there until 1991. So, you know, it's like four seasons of Star Trek happened out there. You know that was in, I wouldn't have had if it was on cable, so it's just really completely the opposite of what we're used to with Star Trek with having to pay for it. And yeah, it seems like they used it to get all those people to jump on board, and they had really good numbers at first. I don't actually have the numbers in front of me, but from what I understand, they had really pretty good numbers at first, promising numbers, and then they just like they lost like so many people, like half the people that signed up jumped off at some point, and I, I guess it's not good. Yeah, that's definitely not good. And it also feels like it kind of goes against the Starfleet code to have to pay for Star Trek. You know what I mean? Yeah. It is funny. It's very funny. It's ironic. But so they go on the CBS uh, app. I buy it because I'm I'm just a psycho fan and I wanted to review it. I had to see it. And those first two episodes weren't enough. And in fact, the first two episodes were such a like prologue or prequel or something to what was really going to happen in the seasons. And, you know, spoilers, obviously, if anybody's listening to this, we're going to spoil the whole goddamn thing for you. So I uh, hope you've watched Star Trek Discovery if you're listening to this. But, you know, in the end, they solve the problem. You know, to to be honest, they solve the whole problem. They com- come to a complete story arc by the end of this first season they started off with the big problem and what michael burnham did and why is she called michael burnham that just throws people off just all these unnecessary little things that kind of irk people and it's like why is she michael burnham it's not a thing about like transgender it's not a thing about equality or having names and men and women it's literally the director something like he knew a michael burnham or he knew a michael and so he wanted to call her michael burnham just because he wanted to use that name which i just find that to be bizarre yeah, I think it was a little bit of pandering towards uh, diversity, and I think maybe they intended to r- originally have the character be transsexual, but then maybe they thought partway through that maybe that's going a little bit too far, so let's kind of like pull back a little bit, and we'll have it so that this character was raised uh, by Spock's parents, and the only human name they knew was Michael. And they didn't understand that it was uh, gender derivative, uh, so that's just what it's what stuck, I guess. And they didn't even, and that was weird too. Like to throw her into the Spock family and stuff was really weird. Um, they, that was very forced. I, <laughs> I, I'm not necessarily okay with it, but as as the the series progressed, um, it didn't bother me as much as it did initially. Yeah, same thing. It was just kind of like, okay, whatever. I thought Sarek was a little weird. One minute, I, Sarek, I was like, yeah, that's Sarek. And then other minutes, I was like, this just isn't Sarek. Like, I don't understand what's, what he's doing. Um, I, and the, yeah, especially towards the end of the season, like his motivations and his actions were didn't seem Vulcan at all, let alone the Sarek we know. Yeah, and then at the end, he even said something to her like, something about like love or you have to love or you have to something weird. And it was like, that's like, 
that's not Sarek. Sarek had to like it was it was shocking when Sarek would show that sort of love or compassion for Spock. So and it was shocking even in the new reboot movies when, you know, at the end Sarek admitted in that episode uh, the first the first movie that oh well I I married your mom cuz I loved her cuz he wouldn't say that before. He was like I married her because it was logical. And then by the end right. of the movie he's like, "Oh, you know, I married her cuz I loved her." Cuz he you know, he says that to Spock. But that's the Sarek that that's the character of Sarek usually is that he sort of keeps all those emotions very tightly locked. And it was like this Sarek was just throwing shit out there all over the place. Um it almost seems to me like he favorite favors Michael a little bit more than Spock, yeah. but of course, at this point, we don't necessarily know how old Spock is. I mean, if this, the series of events here is supposed to be taking place, what, like 20 years before uh, the original series, I believe? I think they're on, um, oh God, what is it, like 22, I don't remember the dates, I'm not the biggest uh, fan of the dates, like 2256, 2258 or something, they are a couple years, you know, before um, he's on the Enterprise in the first movie, in the first reboot movie. Right. So Pike's on there. Spock may or may not be on the Enterprise at this time. I don't know. Um, let, let's talk about the fact that the visual elements, like they clearly are going for, or you know, that this is not a reboot, but it's a visual reboot. So, you know, you're going to see stuff that doesn't look like an, an Enterprise, right, in 2001 or 2002. Enterprise went back at some point and we saw this timeline, but we saw it look just like it did back in the original Star Trek, uh, original series. But in this show, you know, we see the Enterprise at the end of the season. It's the cliffhanger. And I mean, big spoiler, yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, got, I got to admit, I know it's kind of off topic at this point, but man, that was a mark out moment for me. I just, I, I couldn't help it, regardless of my overall feelings. Uh, of of the show itself, I was like, "Oh man, it's a goddamn Enterprise." That's awesome. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Like, and, and fan service to hang you in for the next to jerk you in for the next season. I, I right. became worn down by the war stuff that, in this in this stuff. Like, I, I'm glad. I'm actually glad the way the last couple episodes played out because the cliffhangers at the end of episodes always hung out with like, "Oh, you know, they kind of resolve something a little bit." But now, get now. There's a bunch of murder and war again, and I was like, I'm so sick of the war and the Klingons and, you know, all this just fighting and war. And they really solved it by the end of the of the end of the season. So I'm happy about that. But let's go into the political aspect of this show. First of all, I'll start by saying, I I, I like the show. I definitely would have liked it a lot better if it was a, um, regular sci-fi show and not a Star Trek show. But a lot of the Star Trek elements that came into play at some point, um. I feel like it's more Star Trek at the end of it. I feel like over the last few weeks, it's become a little more Star Trek than it there was. There were definitely flashes of Star Trek in there, and I totally 100% agree with you on what you said about uh, liking the show. I, I would like it a lot better if it wasn't Star Trek at all. Yeah, that that's because the thing that gets in the way. It it tries to use some of these elements of classic Star Trek, but they're used in a setting like how you mentioned earlier about uh, the visual elements. Everything is totally updated, and it feels more like the Kelvin timeline in the movies than it does actual television Star Trek. Well, and, and why didn't they just... They should have told this story in the future. Uh, it would have been way better, because we they could have... That would have made way more sense, yeah. All these new technologies and new things that we're seeing and new ideas, like the jumping thing would have been way better... Because you would have said, wow, like, this is new. Like, if they can just do this, this is crazy. And even even when they sort of ban it at the end and uh, try to bury it and hide it, that would have been fine too. But they don't even... But because it's happening back then, it's like they had to, they had to like, cut, they had to give all this exposition into why it's not going to be seen again. You know, like, we're going to hide this and never show anyone this technology. Um, and so, okay, that's why they don't have it on TNG or something years later. Right, yeah, and and I thought the concept of the spore drive was phenomenal. Uh, the problem I had is is what you just said is that what happened to that technology? It's like you know, it's the same thing. Why did Spock never mention a sister? Why why in Starfleet did no one ever mention the spore drive technology or anything like that before? Uh, with the retconning, it it's just 
it, it makes me question these things like you know how is that going to play out in the in the future in later seasons or you know later episodes or maybe even in later movies will they bring the spore drive back will that be a thing like a big uh deus ex machina that they have to use you know oh we have to bring back the spore drive yeah like somebody else figures it out or is using it and then they have to use it to stop them like all those things yeah that, that stuff could all happen later on i hope it goes away to be honest but it could come back and I'm just hoping this next season is more sort of sci-fi. I hope they go more into sci-fi and kind of traditional Star Trek. That would be really nice if that could happen. I mean, I'm envisioning the problem when the when the season picks up being something to do with a anomaly in space that happened to the Enterprise or something, because that's why they have a stress call. But going back to the sort of political side of things, obviously CBS and everybody that they had admitted that the Klingons were supposed to represent Trump supporters. So, like, going into this, I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit, although in the past in Star Trek, they've always politicized, um, you know, the Klingons or the Romulans or somebody to sort of represent something that was going on politically. So, that wasn't too much of a shock in a way. I had more of an issue with the political agenda of the casting. And I know that there's some people out there that get this and there's some people that roll their eyes at this, but I can't stop... um, and I don't want to think this way because I'm not somebody who's hardcore right or left, but um, I, I want there to be more diversity. I expected there to be more diversity in this show than any other Star Trek show before because we're going where we're going in the future and the optimism and everybody working together and stuff. But exactly, yeah. I couldn't bring myself to look over the fact that sort of the main Helms woman, girl, the female Helms girl that we don't really see. She's got that metal thing on her face. I don't even know her name. She barely speaks. She's a female. Um, this guy off to the left who's in, like, ops or something, he doesn't say much either. He's a black guy. There's also another female in the front on the left that we don't hear a lot from. She's got braids. Uh, she's a black girl. Um, the captain is a white man, but, big spoiler, later on we find out he's an evil bad guy. So if you look at the cast and the crew... There are, and we know there's an agenda right now to sort of vilify white males among Hollywood. Um, Males overall, but white males specifically, if they can do it. Um, The only white male that's a good guy on the show is um, the sport drive guy. What's his name? Anthony Rapp, his character. What's his name? Oh, um, <laughs> Lieutenant, uh, God, I can't, Stamets. Stamets, yeah. Lieutenant so, Stamets. So Anthony Rapp's the only one. Um, who is a is an is a is a good guy, um, but he's safe because he's gay. But he's gay, yeah, exactly. So it's like there are no straight white males that are good guys. Yeah, even his boyfriend, the doctor, is uh, what Latino, I guess. Oh, I thought he was like like black and Latino, but like yeah. something, some maybe like Puerto Rican or or one of those type of islanders. And then uh, you have the other male character ash tyler who's middle eastern right but has that has that white guy name but is know. a good guy but is a good guy yeah yeah it's a very underlying thing to sort of say see all these these people are good but maybe white guys are bad you know maybe white men are bad um and that's i just can't like sort of like look past that a little bit thinking like this is kind of weird uh saru is a is played by a white male but he's an alien so it's trumped by that you can't even tell he's an alien so I don't know, when you look at that overall, it just gives me a little bit of a sour feeling like, man, why do we, you know, why why is it like this? Why do they do these things? Um, I feel like the forced diversity there took away from a lot of the show elements that I ended up enjoying. Like, if it wasn't so forced and spoon-fed, I think uh, I, I would have liked it a lot more. And I didn't dislike the season overall. Uh, I'm not completely 100% invested, but I am interested in seeing where it was going and like I said earlier there were even a few mark out moments for me yeah it's like I, I think I think the same way I almost feel the same way about the movies like the the Chris Pine movies like I'm kind of like not a hundred percent on it at all but at the same time I liked many things that I saw it's almost like seeing when you see a cover song it's like hearing a cover song of a song you love you love a song and then you hear a cover song and maybe maybe you're like well you cannot do as good as the original and some of that cover song was weird but Every once in a while, you want to put the cover song on just to hear the version in a different way. So right. that's sort of what I'm seeing out of this Star Trek. But, you know, and last time with Enterprise, I did this with Enterprise. I didn't watch it. I actually refused to watch Enterprise um, back in 2001 and 02. 
And then I ended up watching it, giving it a chance, and I became hooked on it, and I loved it. Um, I don't think I'm there yet with this. I'm not hooked on it, but I'm, but kind of interested in seeing the rest of it. So, yeah, you know, I'm definitely getting there. There were some elements that I I very much enjoyed when they were in the uh, Terran universe. I yeah. loved all of that. That I mean, was and, awesome. And it felt very very cinematic. But it also felt uh, it felt Star Trek in a, a grand theatrical again sort of way, like like that could have been a major motion picture. Yeah, that's the other thing is the world feels huge here. Uh, it really feels big, and also the Terran universe too. To be in that 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 uh, mirror mirror universe, the coolest thing was probably what they wanted. But it it's because it tied us in. It tied me into all the other Star Trek episodes that ever had to do with the Terran universe. Like I remember many of the other plots and many of the other stories in the other uh, series about the mirror universe. So getting to see this and then hearing all the background and you're like, Oh my God, like they're connecting this with that and they're connecting in everything. So in a weird way, right. they, they, they connected more with all the other star Treks with being in the alternate mirror universe than they did being in the regular universe. I thought, um, but real quick on the, on the uh, casting and the agenda, um, you have, uh, Philip, uh, Philip Giorgio, who's, you know, female Asian, uh, um, Michael Burnham, Black female Asian. I mean, black female. <laughs> black female Asian. Yeah, she's both. She's both black female and Asian. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, then she would be super. But then also the main admiral. The main admiral is also a female. Another female character, yeah. right? Yep. So it's just again, it's sort of like that over that tone of women are in charge of you sort of thing, um, which is like that's the thing is like there's not a problem with women in charge because that's fine. I would have been even fine with. Um, the captain and Michael Burnham being both female like they were. Uh, captain Philip George before she died. Uh, her and Michael Burnham, female characters. I get the bond. I like it. Um, but then when you made Lorca a bad guy, it's kind of like, you know, oh, so there there, there he was, but he's a bad guy. It's kind of like Ghostbusters all over again. Like Right, and that really pissed me off because I was invested in Lorca. I was like, here is a, a strong male character who knows what he's doing. He's the captain of the starship. Uh, he he's got this experimental uh, spore drive that could do amazing things, and this is going to be awesome. I'm really going to get into this, and then it turns out he's a bad guy, and I'm like, son of a bitch! At the end of the next season, so season two's coming up. At the end of the next season, and by the way, that was can I say can we talk about how because I haven't been talking about it much with anybody because I don't want to spoil it for people. I know a lot of people didn't watch yet. That is one of the most shocking flips. I've ever seen ever like the cre if I could give credit to the show for that that was and I know that they like you know the whole time you're like he's gonna end up being bad I even said that many times like oh he's gonna end up being a bad guy or he's like perverted or something's weird about him but they definitely telegraphed it they did but like I never saw I just never saw it coming into the that he was from the mirror universe and it was nope. so much crazier than I expected so it was like holy shit like, this is one yeah. of the best heel turns I've ever seen. <laughs> Retroactively, I was totally cool with it because, you know, I can usually predict anything in a, a television show or, or movie, especially these days. It's so obvious. But, uh, you know, I expected Lorca to be a bad guy, but the way they revealed it as him being a Terran when uh, the the Terran version of Georgia Philippou was looking out at the reactor and she kind of shied away from it with her eyes and Burnham's like, oh, you have light sensitivity. I was like, motherfucker, Lorca is from the Terran universe. Right, right. That's so funny, man. That's, wow, man. You know, I didn't even notice that. I'm pretty naive. Like, and sometimes in movies, I just kind of watch like derp, you know, and then later on, I figure it all out. Like, I don't, I don't get like Leah gets that way. Like Leah will be like, "Oh, I knew it." Like she knew Luke Skywalker, you know, wasn't really there in Star Wars. She saw the 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 her foot move and everything, oh, and she right. She just knew in the theater. She goes, "Oh, she said something," and I was like, "What is she doing?" You know, and I was watching it, and then I'm shocked by it, and she's not. So like she picks up on that stuff too, and I I don't I don't it doesn't get ruined for me. I can shut my uh, kind of brain off a little bit, but you know, my in getting to this. I believe that you'll see him again. I think you will see the uh, the regular version of of Lorca. I, Lorca, I yeah. I was I was just talking this about this with a friend earlier. I was like, I don't think that's the last time we're going to see Lorca because if you think about it, he was dropped into that reactor, which is 
basically the Terran version of the spore drive in a way, even though it is corrupt. So I'm wondering if his consciousness kind of got spread into that zone the same way that uh, Stamets did earlier in the season. Well, I just think that we're going to see the the good Lorca and then he's not dead. You know, I'm thinking. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility, too. At the end of season two is when you would reveal that, like, you know, like the Enterprise, you know, somebody some ship shows up or they're on some planet and somebody says, like, you know, we want. Some, we want your money or we want some shit. We want all your dilithium shit or whatever. Something in exchange for the for the for the uh, for the Starfleet officer, and they're just like, "What? What Starfleet officer?" You know what I mean? And then then all of a sudden you see Lorca in chains, you know, or something, and it's like, "What the fuck?" Like, and then it ends. You know, that's where I would see because I gotta believe that they'd bring Jason Isaacs back, and they definitely could. Not they He's don't such have a to. fantastic actor, man. He's so great. Yeah, and he he is. Uh, <laughs> He's such a lefty, though. It's funny. He was fighting with everybody on Twitter. Like, even if you, uh, you know, said anything. Like, I made a joke to him. I said, well, you must be a bad guy, right? I, this was at the beginning of this. Like, the third episode happened. And, you know, I hate to be a dick because, you know, I'm, and I think you're kind of like this, too. Like, I, I like to be kind of a dick even though I'm not. Like, in real life, even though I'm pushing people's buttons, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, make people upset and hurt people's feelings. But at the same time, it was like... You know, I'm going to still give people some shit. And I said to him in the third season on Twitter, because he was talking shit to people on Twitter, and I really like Jason Isaacs, but I said, uh, I said, so yeah, so you must be a bad guy, right? Because you're the only straight white male. <laughs> and, oh, I bet he loved that. Oh, he was pissed, dude. He wrote, so he just, I, I got blocked pretty quickly, but... Um, you know, it's but I, but it's honest. You know, that's how that's how I felt, and that's what you can see. And th- so, see how that sort of the the, the over agenda gets in the way of the fun for us. But but not really because I have pushed it aside a little bit. Um, but even Harry Mudd, you know, uh, was play, was in this movie. Harry Mudd makes his return. Mudd's back, and of course, you know, he's of course a white male, <laughs> you know, uh, as right. he was on the regular series. But just just kind of funny, you know, just a, something that I have to keep looking forward to now, and, and may, maybe not, but I wonder who the next captain's going to be. You that know? was a big question, too. I mean, they're going to Vulcan to pick him up, so I'm really curious. That's it, Well, and it, will they make it there, or will they not make it there till shit, you know, they could not make it there till the end of the season, for all we know, with all the stuff that's, that's going to go on, you know? Um, because the roadblock now is the Enterprise showed up, and there's a distress signal, so... I'll tell you what. That's kind of where we were left off, yeah. They they have so much to work with, though, writing-wise, and I hope they do a really good job with it. Um, wh- I also hope at some point, and this is to to change uh, gears here a little bit, I really had hoped that they'd done something in the future so that they could have involved you know, the universe that we know a little bit and, done, and kept on the track of... Because what is it? Something like uh, hmm, 17 years since Voyager? Because... Enterprise was a prequel, so Voyager was the right. last thing we saw. Why can't we get, you know, 20 years into the future of that time or 30 years into the future of that time? And I want to see what Starfleet looks like and what's, what's going on with everything and, you know, where they could be. Like, it would really, really be compelling if they could do that. And I thought that, you know, they would do something like that and put it on Netflix. But the other thing I thought of, maybe they could do like a... TNG reunion in the, in that time where everybody comes together for one two three episodes, um, and they really uh, and they bring back the old cast. But was that something that you would like to see, or that's don't do that? No, I, I would love to see a bunch of stuff like that, and I think there's definitely potential there. We've already seen elements of time travel, alternate dimensions, which is typical Star Trek anyway. So yeah, I, I, I would love to see some of that. I think that there's a lot of potential. Uh, especially where Voyager left off. There's so much stuff that could be covered there that I was really disappointed when they announced Discovery was a prequel. And then I was like, you got to be kidding me. And then I saw some of the original uh, artwork and designs for the Discovery ship, and I'm like, this looks like crap. Yeah. This looks ter- this w- looks worse than the first Enterprise. Yeah, it, it, it does look a little bit... Some of the ships look a little um, flat, I want to say. like They look almost like... They don't look as epic as I feel like they should, but but I don't know. But it's not too bad, you know. I, I'm actually it's grown on me. I don't mind it now. But th- there's a guy on YouTube that like breaks down. I don't know if you ever seen this. He breaks down like all the ships, and he's already got a, like a 30 minute video on the new Enterprise that we saw just from that episode, like comparing it like the the dorsal fin to the like every other Enterprise there's ever like <laughs> that's ever been done. It's wow. pretty crazy. 
I, w- <laughs> I don't remember his name, but if you look up, you know, breaking down the Enterprise or deconstructing Enterprise ships, and if you search that type of stuff, you'll find his videos. But um, what now? Let's tie this all into the new movie that's coming out eventually here. Um, script is done, I think, or it's coming. Oh, it's almost no, no. I'm sorry, that was J.J. Abrams talking about Star Wars. I think. Um, so script is not done. We don't know for this new or fourth installment of the Chris Pine, uh, J.J. Abrams Star Trek, which I, I thought, in, I guess Quentin Tarantino is going to be the director, and. The, yeah, I heard about that. That's and it's going to have an R rating. Well, of course it's Quentin Tarantino. He's not going to do anything less. But uh, I can't imagine a Star Trek movie directed by Quentin Tarantino. I mean, it, it's set in the future where uh, you know so, sh- social justice has finally prevailed. You know, I mean, we all know Quentin Tarantino is a huge fan of using the N word multiple times in his movies. You know, how is that going to yeah. work in? Are we going to see like? Uh, a lot of sex and like hyper violence. But, but you know something? I would point you in the. Di- I I know a lot of people go there with that, but I would point you to the direction of like a good Star Trek episode, which is always like a submarine sort of battle where where two captains deliver amazing dialogue and there's great dialogue in the movie. Look at Death Proof. Uh, look at that movie with the car chase where Kurt Russell uh, kills the women in the car. You ever see that one? Oh, yeah, and one of the best aspects of that movie was the dialogue. Right, so the dialogue is so amazing in that movie. I mean, it's so boring, though, to some people that half the people left the theater when I was watching it. But I thought that movie was... I liked that a lot better than the zombie one before. Um, you know, the Robert Rodriguez one, which was fun, and it was hilarious and awesome. But oh, it, uh, Planet, Planet, Planet Terror, Terror, I think. Yeah, that was the last yeah, thing. Yeah, no, uh, Death Proof was way better. But yeah, but quality, like yeah, but like yeah, exactly. You watch Planet Terror a couple times; it's amazing, and that you don't really watch it again. But I can watch the Death Proof one over and over again and get different little things from it. And so, if he could incorporate that type of writing, which you know doesn't have the N word, doesn't really even have a lot of swears in it, to be honest. If you could incorporate that into Star Trek, that's pretty fucking amazing, you know. Um, right. But. The rumor is that they're going to be doing the thing that we thought they would do every movie because every movie come, that comes out, people talk about this. They're gonna they're gonna do City on the Edge of Forever. They're gonna do that that time you know that big time warp machine or whatever they find on that planet. And so somehow this is going to involve time travel. So which which could be easily done because that's an actual episode of the first series. That's the one I think where. They go back to Earth and like Edith Keeler dies and everything. Um, or oh she, yeah, okay, yeah, I remember that episode pretty well now. And it's I think that's the one. Um, and yeah, I, I oh God, it's been I I watched the original series a lot, but I I would say that I haven't really. I given haven't it. watched it in a long time either. It's been seven or eight years since I've given it a real watch for the most part. So, but I did love that episode. If that's the one, if that's City on the Edge of Forever, Forever, which I think it is. Um, I'm sure there's some Star Trek listener listening to us like, what the fuck? Yeah. You guys don't know shit! Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but I don't go that deep. Like you mentioned Enterprise. I've yet to even watch Enterprise yet. Wow. You should watch it. I mean, I know that at first, I actually, me and Leah are the exact same way a little bit. The only difference is I eventually gave it a chance, and she never did. But... When I um, heard the theme song, I was like, what the hell is this show? I was like, this is not Star Trek. You know, it was like Rod Stewart singing, I've got faith of the heart. And I'm like, what is this crap? I'm like, I'm not watching this. So That's actually one of the problems I have, and it's a minor problem, so I could look past it, but it, the little problem with Discovery is the opening, because the opening, even the theme, doesn't feel like Star Trek. It almost, yeah. to me, feels like a combination of, if you ever watch the show Fringe and uh-huh. uh, Westworld. It feels like a combination of those, and I'm like, this isn't very Star Trek feeling. The guy that made the theme or that put the theme together, I believe, is the guy that did a lot of those other themes in the 90s. Like the, not, it's not the same guy, but he did a lot of those themes. You know, like the sort of like the Full House beginning. It almost has that sound to it. With what like, app do predictability? Yeah, it's yeah. like there's like saxophone. <laughs> like it just. But but <laughs> anyway, I I was at home and one day I think it was I think it might have been it was either September 11th or it was you know, it was after September 11th. But I was in my room and it was on, and I think I just said, "Screw it, I'm gonna watch it." And I watched it and I. I was like, I kind of like this. This is interesting. And then I wanted to watch another episode, so I waited, you know, had to wait. I caught it the next week. 
And then I said, what are they on the second season? And they were on the end of the second season. And I, I said, you know what? I'm going to stop watching it because I didn't want to spoil it. So right. I ran to the store. I think it was like Strawberries Music, which they don't have anymore uh, up here in New England. But And I bought the first season. It was like in a capsule DVD collection, and I was like, thought it was the coolest thing. Popped them in, and I binge-watched like see, after one after another, and, and I really liked it. Uh, there was some little problems with it, you know, but I really liked it because Voyager and Deep Space Nine seemed so similar to sort of TNG in a way that they were like brothers and sisters of it, but this felt different. Um, there were some issues with it a little bit, but I, I honestly, I can tell you right now that it's my second favorite Star Trek. Like, I know that that's like blasphemy wow. to like the original series, like people, but it's just my personal thing. Cause like at the time I was in high school, I, and I watched it and I started watching it on TV when the third season came out, I was watching it live with the seasons. Um, I got very angry when they were going to cancel it and then they did cancel it in the fourth season. We knew it. And I was just so mad, dude. Like, in the fourth season is, like, one of the best seasons. It it got better. Like, it was kind of like TNG. But if you... Th- it got so much better. And by the fourth season, I was like, I hope this has to go on. And, and it didn't. And they kind of rushed the whole... At the beginning, like, the whole arc of the story was sort of like, can we do it? Can we... Can humans, uh, you know you know explore space and everything without the vulcans and really do everything on our own and all these other things um and and there was no federation of planets yet you know we're going to unite everybody and that sort of was was done but skipped around a little bit you know what i mean it, like it didn't get the full story it should have um there was a controversial right. episode in the last one of the last episodes was very controversial because of something they did um if you haven't seen it so you'll did see it. did uh did the the series get an actual decent send off. Like, were they able to wrap up like certain storylines and things by the time the show was canceled, no, or did it kind of just leave you hanging? A it, little bit? it really was a depre. The last episode is fairly depressing, um, I will say. And not only that, the last episode is depressing, but the second to last episode, like I don't want to spoil it for people who didn't watch it, but like the second to last episode kind of had a little bit involvement of previous casts. And it sort of oh, okay. took, a, took a little bit away. Um, but I, I liked it. I just thought it shouldn't have been done last. And they basically skipped ahead like five years, you know, or three or four years or something or six years. I don't know what it is. Oh, uh, the, the classic time jump trope. Yep. And then so it ends with the end of their whole journey and stuff. But, but you know, they skip all the other stuff as if, you know, because we didn't get to see it, obviously. Exactly. So, yeah. Unfortunately, well, it, it was a rushed sort of ending. And one of the last episodes... The last episode is is the last episode, but it's kind of a weird last episode because it's tying tying up all that stuff from in the future. So it doesn't feel like it's connected as much. And then with other involvement from other stuff, and then with the second to last episode being kind of a depressing episode. So it it does end a little bit weird, unfortunately. Like Leah hates the ending, but but she was the same way as me. She didn't like the opening theme, so she never watched it. Well, I I would watch it at home here. And she would say, oh, you're watching that stupid Star Trek one? <laughs> and, and, and eventually she started watching it. And then eventually she likes it. So now she really likes it. It's like one of her favorite yeah. ones. Um, I'll definitely check it out. I'll add it to my queue. Yeah, I, I, I've watched everything else Star Trek related except for this for whatever reason. I just never got around to it. I was the same way. Actually, to be honest, the only Star Trek I haven't seen is a lot of Deep Space Nine. I haven't seen beyond season two of Deep Space Nine. Which, oh, Deep Deep Space Nine is probably my favorite Star Trek, actually. Yeah, that's what everyone tells me. Is like, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people tell me that that's their favorite. And I'm like, I could, I didn't get into it because the I don't know why. It's the same way. But the good, you know what the best thing is, is that I didn't get into it, and there's still Star Trek I can watch. Like it's still exactly. sitting there. Like I'm right, really that's excited. That's why I'm happy about Enterprise. Yeah, like you can, st- and, and it's, I think I think you like it. I think people will like it. The first season you know, is all right. And the second season is okay ish. Um, it has really a few good, really good episodes, but definitely like it gets better as it goes. So, you know, it's, that's the good news. But the other thing is about city on the edge of forever is yeah. When a temporarily insane Dr. McCoy accidentally changes history and destroys his time, Kirk and Spock follow him to prevent the disaster. But the price to do so is high. So, you know, I don't know how he's going to do um, City on the Edge of Forever, and I assume what's going to happen is, what I would guess is that they're going to go back in time, 
you know, and and they may not go back into time at the same time Kirk and Spock did back then in that show. They might go back to nowadays. They might go our present time, you know. And that's a little bit of what I'm a little bit worried about, because um, you know, what I mean, you want to see Star uh, Trek. I get it. You know I what I mean? It. And they come back here to prevent something. They screw something up, and now they got to fix things. But they're in our present time, so now everybody's swearing, and there's people being killed, and you know all that stuff. And that would explain the R rating and why Quentin Tarantino. You know, might be involved in Oh, it. that's smart. I never thought about that, but I just thought about it now. Um, yeah, that's really clever, actually. Be- because, yeah, because then you're you're talking about not only not only are they going to go back in time to maybe our time right now, but they're also going to screw up something so badly that things are going to get ugly, you know? So he's now working on a parallel timeline that's probably going to be really evil and dark, and that's why they have to fix it. And well, maybe they'll come back to... Uh, 2018 and accidentally drop the enterprise on Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, it will be something like that. Like Trump will be the will be the in charge of everything and they'll have to stop him. Um, or maybe the, <laughs> or or they'll go to what they did before, which I think was um, was it World War Two or something like that. Uh, it was something. Yeah, like it was that. World War Two because wasn't that the uh, yes the episode where they had to dress like Nazis? Yes, yes. So they could I love well, that episode. So they could um, yeah, they could end up having to go. Back. Oh no, that's a different episode. That that Nazi one, but. But it's something to do like that. Like Edith Keeler is the one who prevents something and something happens, and I, I don't quite remember how it goes. But, you know, you could take all those situations and do something with it, so I could see that. I was hoping that wouldn't be what happened. I was hoping that they would do a thing where they needed help and you could bring back, like, you know, Patrick Stewart and, like, all this shit. He's an admiral, and they're in the future, and then they're in the... You know, I mean, that would be a little contrived, maybe, and that would be stupid, but... Um, I can't help it. I'm greedy. I want to see something like that. But oh yeah, absolutely, definitely want to see some stars thrown in there. And if they're on an alternate timeline with the films now, anyway, yeah, then, then things can definitely be different. I mean, who knows if uh, Picard ever captained the Enterprise D, or maybe they didn't save him from the Borg, oh, so they... they end up in the future where <laughs> they have to fight the Borg, and you know, John Luke Picard is Lacutus, and they. <laughs> You know, well, he's like the Borg King. Well, even weirder, think about if they do go back into a parallel time, they, they create a parallel timeline in the timeline that's already a parallel universe. It's, my head's going to explode. Oh, Jesus. That's, <laughs> oh, my God. That's too much. Too much time travel. Because, I mean, I'm able to I'm able to separate these movies. I know that these movies don't really count. They're in a, a different universe. So because I'm able to, because they gave us that, you know what I mean, in the first movie, um, and they were very. I was okay of it. with that, actually. Me too, because it, then it, it's like it made sense. Well, right, because it's almost like that's kind of what I was hoping they'd say about these prequels, the Discovery prequel, going back to Discovery, because when they do that, I can say to myself, okay, good, like this isn't interfering with the timeline that I know of. My Star Trek still exists, that whole universe. This is just sort of a, you know, an extra little bonus thing that's out there that I can throw away as nothing. But then again, why not? Why not just not call it Star Trek then? But I true. I don't know. I get it. But overall, going back to Discovery, I guess we went through kind of a little bit of the Star Trek universe everywhere and started feeling each other out. Because me and old man Davey here have never talked about Star Trek, or really, we don't really ever talk about anything. No, we part. we uh, we've had some short conversations uh, back when your Discord was still up and running, but that's about it. We've never had the opportunity to actually sit down and have a conversation, just the two of us, about anything really. So this is actually pretty nice for me. I, yeah. I'm excited to go watch uh, Star Trek now. <laughs> I just hope they yeah, do something too, good, Yeah, me too, actually. Man. I kind of want to watch the last few minutes of the last episode of Discovery just to see the Enterprise again. <laughs> <laughs> and I know people are freaking out, like, oh, they're going to make it. No, they're going to make it all about Enterprise. I don't think so. I think it'll be one or two episodes, and that'll be it. At, at the most, yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't think the whole... I think this is... They'll get through things pretty quickly, probably, even. Um you know, and I don't know what they'll do. There's so much. There's so many different stories they could do, uh, from what we're seeing here. But um, oh man, what was I gonna say? But yo, but so with the movies, as far as the movies go, this is gonna be the fourth movie in the in the uh, in the reboot alternate timeline universe of J.J. Abrams. This movie will definitely. I don't know what where else you could go. I mean, after a fourth movie, I feel like no matter what, there probably won't be a fifth movie, no matter what. But uh, if the movie like does really well. Then maybe they'll get a sixth, mo- uh, a fifth movie. But if this movie doesn't do so well, I would assume that it would be dead at that point. That they would, that would be it as far as Star Trek. I was actually surprised after the last one that they were going to go ahead and make a new one. 
They announced because early I didn't they think were the last one did very well uh, financially, and I didn't really care for it that much either. Yeah, everybody said it was like one of the best Star Trek y type ones, and it was like, um, I don't know, the villain was weak again. Just, I haven't enjoyed the villains. I thought the most interesting villain was the first movie. Eric Bana's uh, character was the most interesting, like his world was going to blow up, and so he went, you know... I want Spock dead now! <laughs> yeah, yeah, his voice said he'd like this <laughs> captain of a like a, a pirate ship or something. Yeah, There's I love Spock. Eric Bana anyway. He's such a great actor. Very underrated. He was great in that role. That's, that's actually my favorite of the three. Uh, I didn't yeah. care for the second one very much, but I'm not a big fan of... Uh, Benachin Cumberfuck, you know, I, I really don't care about that guy. He has a weird long face that kind of throws me off a little bit. It's a little uncanny valley for me. It's like, is this guy an android or what the fuck even is he? But I mean, it was okay. I didn't like how they represented the Klingons in that either. It was just a, too big of a change for me. I mean, I understand the timeline sh shifting, but it's not going to fundamentally change the nature of Klingon DNA. No, you wouldn't think so. And but I mean, it, it it it's fine for what it was. I didn't really care for it too much. I didn't like the the switching roles with uh, Kirk and Spock from Rathacon. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a little cheesy and, and unnecessary. Spock's the one beating the shit out of him at the end of the movie. Yeah, uh, I don't know. There, there, I liked the first one. The second one was okay. The third one was whatever. But they're a little too action oriented and that's kind of the problem i had with discovery too while i mm -hmm. i did like very much liked elements of it i thought it was a little too fast paced for a star trek yeah yeah no it definitely was i, I like i like my I, I would like to have more uh like monster of the week episodes like classic star trek always had a week by week ep uh storyline going on like you yeah. have You'd have one week is just one self-contained story, and then the next week is the same, and the next week is the same. You might have a two-part episode at the end of the season or something like that. But uh, Discovery is a lot like modern television where it had this overarching storyline which carried everything else along, and there weren't very many episodes that stood on their own. Yeah, and I mean they, they clearly wanted to go for that. They clearly sort of – they wanted to make their own Game of Thrones. It was almost like, what do we have that's like Game of Thrones? You know, oh, Star Trek. You know, before it used to be, let's do what Star Wars does, you know. But it seemed here that it was very much like, let's do Game of Thrones, Star Trek. Even the opening was a very much like a Game of Thrones opening in a way. Um, exactly, yep. But yeah, and then just, do, it reminds me of Game of Thrones. Like, if you were to say, like, I want to do Game of Thrones, but Star Trek, um, with Star Trek, this is what you would do. I mean, there's people dying, there's swears... Uh, there's more blood and stuff. It was the Klingon Air Empire felt very much like something out of Game of Thrones. Right. Yeah. It was like it was just terrifying, like what they did with them. And and, and I mean, I, I thought they went a little too far with the Klingons. I thought they were a little too much, you know, sort of like mutant looking. Uh, I get that, you know, the original series they looked very plain. You know, in TNG they changed them and. You know, and then people weren't ma weren't happy then. If you go back then, I, I remember as a kid even people being like, "These aren't the Klingons, or why do the Klingons look like this?" And everybody just kind of ignored it. Um, well, they did the same thing again here. So I mean, in a way, I, that kind of is makes it makes you smile almost, like because you're like, "Well, this is what they've always done." So oh, oh well. But I just yeah, thought they went a little too crazy. Star Trek has always been social justice. It's always definitely had those elements of. All of our peoples coming together to, you know, uh, ex explore strange new worlds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so I was fine with that. I'm, I'm fine with with female characters. That's fine, you know. But, but balance it out a little bit. Don't, don't hit us with this forced diversity bullshit because it's obvious and it's old at this point already. It's getting incredibly tiring. I hope that with season two, they move away from that a little bit and try to develop the characters more on their own without having to be a stand-in for, okay, well, this character is going to represent kind of like the weird, uh, not necessarily autism, but maybe Asperger-type characters yeah. or uh, people who could uh, associate with that. And then, uh, you know, the uh, I don't want to call it the gay agenda because it's not an agenda, but you have the gay characters, which is fine. I don't care about that at all. 
I actually uh, started liking don't... the doctor. The last couple episodes, I was like, you know, I kind of like this doctor now. I'd like him, you know, and then the, then he was gone. <laughs> so I was like, right. oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't see that coming, too. And I was like, well, I'm not too bothered by it. But then the way they incorporated his, his whole thing into uh, Anthony Rapp's character, getting them back home from the Terran universe was fucking phenomenal, bro. The way he was able to navigate the mycelium network yeah was amazing that was i have like i know it's nerdy but i have goosebumps just thinking about it now i was like that was fucking awesome yeah that was kind of cool and i and i I liked i i I liked their relationship so mission accomplished you know i made a joke on one of my other videos too where i said i was like i can't believe they killed the gay guy you know or something like that and somebody was like oh you're homophobic i'm like what the (laughs) fuck are you talking about like People have way too much sensitivity for things like that. Yeah. Uh, to make a quick comparison, though, you know how how um, uh, the the doctor Anthony Rapp's uh, partner how he was taken out, and and I didn't really feel much of emotional impact, but I was thinking about the Orville. Had it been Bordas's partner that yeah. was taken out that way, I probably would have been really fucking upset. Yeah, that would be because- messed up. Is they, they, the way they do it on the Orville is way more low key and natural, and it, it's not forced or pushed on you. That's, I, I don't know, man. If you ask me, the Orville only improved throughout the season. It got better and better and better as it went. Yeah, the Orville was amazing. If people didn't watch that, that was so. Uh, those, those episodes were great. Yet you also felt good when it was over. Um, you know, you didn't feel like war and drag down and darkness. Like you just, like Star Trek was very anti-star trek it was very just you felt horrible after watching it um yeah or, every or, episode was doom and gloom or you felt like excited a little bit but you were kind of like you were excited but like also kind of like damn like whoa but orville you were like that was a fun little time we had you know and that's kind of what the next generation did you know by the end you were you might have learned something or you might have thought about something you didn't think about before um and you got a little bit of that in discovery but yeah no doubt it was a very dark which i normally would you know, promote darkness. Let's let's have some you know dark shit go on. But this was sure. too dark. Like people didn't like Nemesis because they thought uh, Nemesis was dark. I, I actually liked Nemesis. I thought it was the most um, honest with the characters. By the way, of any of the Star Trek Next Generation movies, even though you know it had its problems and it was a little weird, but the the characters were more in character in that movie. I thought than any of the other movies. In, in Insurrection, they were like trying to make everybody be funny uh right yeah i see what you're saying in first contact picard was like a crazy murderer for the borg and i get that he was abducted by them but he was just like crazy like he almost fought Worf. like you know deanna was like drunk and completely unbetazoidish like just everybody was fucking weird Jordy had eyes like it just the whole thing like it people got weird in that movie um generations had so many plot holes and stuff it was so weird but that I st- one was just really poorly written. I, I like all of them in a way, but but I do know that they're they they have their problems. But Nemesis, if you look at Nemesis, it, it's the most honest the characters are. Like and Picard's talking about getting older and how everybody's moving on without him, and Data's talking about that, and you know there's a whole theme there about that, about getting older and what you did with yourself and who you are, um, and who you're going to become, and with you know Patrick Stewart's clone and shit. So there's just, like, if you really look at it, the characters are the most honest in Nemesis out of any other TNG movie, even though First Contact tends to be everyone's favorite movie. It'll, it's been a while, so I'm going to have to go back and actually rewatch those. I've only seen Nemesis once, but I, I liked it. Uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was a good little send-off for everybody, and you're right. Everybody was more like their characters in the television show than they had been portrayed in the films up to that point. Yeah, I mean, even though, like, I mean, Patrick driving a buggy at one point, but it's like he's getting older, so he wants to go on the away mission. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but nobody saw the goddamn movie because <laughs> it was right. so... Yeah, d- that was part of the problem. I mean, Star Trek films have never really performed well uh, theatrically, with maybe the exception of the J.J. Abrams films. At least the first one, anyway, I know was pretty successful. Um, Let me see... I, I think that yeah, I think that like J.J. Uh, Abrams ones have done obviously well, um, and I want to say the voyage the, the voyage home with the whales that one did really well if I remember yeah look I got I got the list right here um, I just pulled it up Star Trek the motion picture the 1979 
that is still the most successful, it says. Um, and then after that, it's Star Trek Beyond. The last Star Trek that came out did the second best. Then Star Trek 2009, and then Star Trek The Search for Spock 1984, then The Voyage Home 1986. I don't know if that's true, though. I don't know. That doesn't seem right. But, uh, hey, whatever. They're mm. all whatever they are. But, um, well, here we go. Actually, no, I got them right here. Yeah. The, the, okay, so the gross. If you want to talk about money, um, then, yeah. $257 million for Star Trek, the original motion picture. $228 million for Star Trek In a Darkness. So In a Darkness wow. and, and Beyond beat out everything else. Um, and that's off the... Wow. So, hmm. So that's 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 ranking. those actually performed well than I anticipated. Yeah, the thirteenth the thirteenth movie, the worst movie was Nemesis with forty three thirty forty three million. And then uh Final Frontier after that, Insurrection after that, Undiscovered Country, Generations. First contact is number five on the list. I mean, because you would say, like, probably Wrath of Khan was every, you know, the one that everybody points to as the best that's, Star Trek movie. Yeah, that's the Enterprise or the uh, Empire Strikes Back of Star Trek. Yeah, and then you got so you got Wrath of Khan and then First Contact, and they're in the seventh and fifth position as far as gross. But uh, so it's kind of funny that they're that they're mm-hmm. up there that they're that far down. I mean, obviously with inflation and everything else, but when you, when you think about Nemesis coming out in two thousand three, did forty three million dollars, and Star Trek two thousand nine. You know, comes out, and that did. Oh, that's the number one movie. Star Trek from two thousand nine is the number one movie. The motion picture is number six. What was the overall gross on two thousand nine? Two hundred and fifty-seven million dollars. Wow, that's crushing. That's crazy. That, that crushes everything else pretty much. The marketing, especially campaign. the uh, original. Yeah. Original films. Yeah, the the marketing campaign for it was nuts. So you probably had, I mean, you had the perfect storm. You hadn't had Star Trek in a while. So then you had every Star Trek fan who wanted Star Trek probably going to see that, you know. And then you had all the new people that never really watched Star Trek but said, yeah, I remember that Star Trek thing. Let's go see that. Because the marketing was so goddamn good for that. Um, and the only problem was they waited too long to make dar- uh, In a Darkness. You know, they waited way too long and they lost a lot of that audience, you know. Um, and, and then women that were dragged to it too. Women that were like, "All right, you know." And, and by the way, I, I don't mean insult people because people always say like, "Oh, you make a thing." The 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 fact is that sci- sci-fi fans are predominantly males. Um, Absolutely. If you look at the statistics, I know there's a ton of women. I mean, my, Leah, my wife, is you know loves Star Trek. So, but there's a I would say it's it's most it's it's mostly a male uh, genre. So that's just. That's just the facts of whatever. So how do you get other females who, who don't watch sci-fi to get into it? So that's what I mean when I say that. I know there's a lot of female fans out there, obviously. Um, you're probably- yeah, you have to incorporate, you know, interesting, strong female characters. But, you, but were, you know, I, it's not you even just that. can't overdo it. It's not even that. Like, my point is that they, they got males who don't usually watch Star Trek to go because and they, they were like, oh, it's kind of cool. Yeah, Star Trek, let's go see. It might be stupid. But it ended up being a pretty good story. But also, a lot of females went to see it that were kind of like, you know, I don't want to be here, you know. Oh, watch this stupid movie. Star Trek is storky and stuff. And the movie starts with, like, Chris Hemsworth in that scene uh, where he uh, sacrifices himself. And, like, to, like, you know, his wife's given birth. And I'm telling you, man, I looked around the theater. I was there. And I seen women crying and shit everywhere like and I was like oh my god like this is genius because anybody who came to the theater who was like I, I came because my husband made me come and stuff like that those right. my boyfriend drags me to Star Trek conventions so I had to go to this movie because he made me yeah yeah I, I went to see Twilight with him so he went <laughs> right. to see Twilight with me so now he can come to I'm gonna go to Star Trek with him and and yeah they it, it, and, and they basically probably came out of that saying that was actually good like I actually liked that, and that so uh, that was a genius opening. I don't know if they planned on that how they did it, but damn, did it work! And well, I'll tell you something, Joe. It got me immediately invested in that film, and I I enjoyed it right away. I'm like, we're starting off with a Federation ship in distress, having to fight this monstrosity that came out of nowhere. Everything looks badass, and uh, yeah, I was like, I'm totally into it. Right. Dude, yeah, they, they 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 did a really good job, and I still think, unfortunately, that was the best one. 
I was hoping that the other ones would get better. They'd do more. And the other ones were good, you know, had good moments. I give them all kind of like 7 out of 10s and stuff like that. But um, that that one, man, was the best one. And and even in that one, I thought, man, we could still get a better villain, though, I think. Um, or wait till Khan shows up. But it ended up being that, nope, uh, Eric Bana's character was the best. Uh, Nero was the was the best that we've gotten so far. But um, yeah. as far as Discovery, you know, I like it. We'll see what happens next. Maybe when Discovery second season comes out, you know, we'll do, like, reviews of every episode or something like that, and Leah will do them too because she wants to talk about it too. And Yeah, um, bring her in on it. That'd be great. Yeah, we'll have a three-way. Sure. I'm definitely down for any kind of three-way you want to bring up. <laughs> Um, any so let's get out of here. This was an insanely long conversation. Um, hope it you guys was. It, it went on way longer than I expected. <laughs> Me too. Hope you guys comment down below. Subscribe to the channel here for more. When we come back with this, tell us what you liked about what we talked about here. And if you have questions or things that we didn't talk about that you want us to focus on, we'll come back and reconvene and talk about it. So put that all in the comments down below. And is there anything you want to plug, uh, Old Man Davy? Uh, at all uh yeah you could catch my weekly show trigger point over at justin bailey's website jbshow.net uh and follow me on twitter at the old man davy i also have a group uh youtube that we've just started recently with me and a few friends of mine we're all working on it together uh it's called the rafters youtube channel so go check that out as well all right cool and uh you guys can see all my links down below and hit me up on twitter uh at corrupted pod and at real joe cronin and we're out of here. Um, I almost, I almost uh, said, "May the force be with you." <laughs> <laughs> Live long and f fuck off. Boldly get the hell out of here. Goodbye. <laughs>